welcome to the 77th episode of the Ultimate Health Podcast. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here to take your health to the next level. Today we have on the show with us Jill Miller, and Jill is just a whole wealth of information in the world of fascia, muscles, and tuning the body up so it's performing at its best. So Jill is the creator of Yoga Tune-Up Therapy Balls, and we get into the different types of balls and what they're used for in the interview today. She studied fitness, yoga therapy, and anatomy for over 28 years, and she's pioneered connecting the fields of fitness, yoga, massage, and pain management. So she's like the glue that brings all those worlds together. Her first book, The Role Model, came out in fall 2014. And Jill, again, is just such a wealth of information. You guys are going to love this. And now a little shout out to our show sponsor and now our app sponsor, Sun Warrior. So Sun Warrior is proudly a sponsor of the new Habits app, which I'm hoping all you guys are hearing about. Uh, you know, we've been launching it on social media. We had a mini cast that we want you to go back to. And Jesse and I are just so excited to be working with Sun Warrior on a regular basis. You know, their products are amazing. We use them consistently. I hope you guys are integrating them into your healthy routines using the Classic Plus Protein, the Ormus Super Greens, the Liquid Light. And uh, yeah, just uh, always send them lots of love because they're always sending us lots of love. So a little bit more about our Habits app. We're just so excited to have launched this. And, you know, it's the new year. We're about three days into the new year. And I myself have started to use my own app to help me integrate some new healthy routines. And I hope you guys are too. And you guys have downloaded it. Yeah, you guys really need to get your hands on this, especially before the end of this month, because it's only $2 right now. It's going to be going up to three February 1st. And it's not just for the podcast. This app is going to help you get your whole healthy lifestyle in check and keep you accountable and just keep these habits you're working on integrating top of mind. So we've been getting a great response so far. You guys are awesome for helping support this new venture of ours. If you haven't gotten your copy, all you need to do is go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash habits Get a copy of this awesome app, and I know you're going to love it. For listeners of the show, you also get a 10% discount on your Sun Warrior products. For that, all you need to do is go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW, orders $100 or more, you get free shipping. So put your order together and take advantage of this really amazing deal. So now back to our guest, Jill Miller. We are so excited to share this with you because we love talking about fitness and the body and movement. This is definitely one of the pillars of health. One of the core uh, categories of habits that we have on the app is fitness and movement. So using these little balls, I don't know if anyone has some of them at home, but they're incredible. You know, they really dig into those spots that we can't quite access, definitely not on our own and often not even with a massage therapist. So really excited for you guys to hear about this. And hopefully after the episode, you will get yourself a pair of balls, no pun intended. Yeah, Marnie and I, we like to keep one in the car. We use it while we're driving around. Be careful if you're going to do that, obviously, because you don't want it rolling away on you. But we also have one by the TV. So if we're watching a documentary or such, we can just roll our feet on it. And yeah, we just love using them. So you guys, I'm sure, are going to love the information in this one. You're going to love having these for yourself at home. They're really reasonably priced. And I recommend after the show, definitely going to get yourself some of Jill's yoga tune-up therapy balls. So some of the things we talk about in this interview, what is fascia and its role in the body? This is often confusing, even amongst natural health practitioners. So it's good to clarify that. Why sitting is the new smoking? I'm sure you guys have heard that before. We dig right into that topic. The importance of your diaphragm, so your breathing muscle that's located right beneath the ribs. We get into that and how to keep that tuned up. And we also talk about what you can use at home right now without having the yoga tune-up therapy balls to start doing some of this myofascial work on your body. Lots of great stuff, as we said before. 
Jill's a really fun person to talk to. You're going to really hear that in our conversation. And if you guys want to check out the show notes, links to everything we talk about on today's show, a more in-depth show summary, head to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Jill, Jill with a J. And we're going to get right into things now with Jill Miller. Hello, Jill, and welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you for having me. We're so happy to have you. What's the weather like over where you are? Do you really want to know? <laughs> I'm I'm afraid to ask. Well, it is sunny, but I'll tell you what, we actually had rain today. I live in Los Angeles and that's just such a rare event, but it was only for about 10 minutes. So, <laughs> so you have some outdoor activities planned for the weekend then? Yes. I'm actually going over to my friend's pool in the hills. It's... <laughs> It's something you can do in Southern California in December. Sorry, folks. Right on. No, embrace it. Enjoy it. Great. And it's funny, I was just thinking, more recently, there was a retweet that went out, and you were tagged in a picture with Marnie and I from the yoga show in Toronto. I think we have a common friend in Jill Mandich, and uh, yeah, no, that just came up on my feed within the last few weeks. Whoa. It is a really small world. Jill took training with me a few years ago, both in Canada and in the US. And we actually have the same initials, which makes us bonded as sisters. Although her first name being spelled with a G, mine being spelled with a J, but we're both E-M. So she's G-E-M, I'm J-E-M. And um, that has made us, you know, literally two stones in a ring together. We just, she's awesome. She totally admires you. And she's such a ball of energy and uh, she's great. And speaking of balls, <laughs> let's uh-huh. talk about how rolling became a form of therapy that you really wanted to explore and dove right into. Well, great segue. And yes, I love to talk about my balls. You know, it's my work didn't start off as being ball therapy. It just happens to be such a, a gateway drug, so to speak a gateway rubber drug to the greater milieu of my work, so to speak. There's lots of different things that we do within the context of yoga tune-up, but the therapy ball work, I think, has been something that people from all walks of life can relate to. Who doesn't need a little bit of self-care? Who doesn't need just on-the-go self-massage anytime you need it? Sure. Well, how did the invention come about? I mean, were you rolling on tennis balls and lacrosse balls and got to the point you thought, I can come up with something better and a better way of doing this? Not really, sort of, yes, kind of. Everything you said, but it was actually much more complicated than that. I was never a person who found their way to self-massage from an injury. I didn't have a terrible fall when I was 17 and suffer a broken collarbone. I came to the work because of emotional stress. I came to the work because of psychological problems. I was bulimic. And in college, I was fighting myself constantly. I was a dancer. In college, on the side, I was studying massage. I was studying shiatsu massage. And I was also studying yoga at different yoga centers around Chicago. I went to school um, in Chicago. And one of the one of the things that really frustrated me about my dancing is that I wasn't very good. <laughs> I was really not a very good dancer. I had very poor coordination. Um, and that actually will come up later when we talk about some of the science behind the, the therapy ball work, but I was very poorly coordinated. And um, I couldn't jump very well, and I couldn't turn very well. And a big part of that was I, I had no sense of center. And part of my dance training was I was studying Pilates in my my school program offered Pilates. My roommate happened to be pre-med and she took the Pilates classes with me and she would always complain about being sore and achy and feeling a burn in her belly. And I never had any muscle soreness, which I thought was weird because I knew that every class was targeting your muscles and, you know, deeper and this and that. And I couldn't feel a thing. And so one day I confessed to my yoga teacher. I said, I am bulimic. And I can't feel my abs. And I'm not sure what was more important to me. I think that feeling my abs at the time was probably more important because when you're really suffering from the disease, you're still living in this illusion of, well, if I only looked better, if I only had this certain shape, then I wouldn't need to throw up anymore. And of course, getting that certain shape would mean that you're working your abs. And so she gave me a prop 
to lay on. It was a was shaped like a hamburger bun. It was stuffed with sand. It was basically a bean bag. And she had me lay belly down on this prop and breathe. And I went from not feeling my abs to feeling. And I felt everything. I felt all of the self-hatred that I had. I felt all of the fear that I had. I felt like I was being punched in the gut. I felt wretched. But that was a good thing because I wasn't feeling any of those feelings. I was just running from them and purging them constantly. And so abdominal self-massage brought me back to my center. And what I would do back in my dorm room is every morning, and I was still suffering, I was still throwing up, but nonetheless, I was finally learning how to perceive some of the subtleties within my body instead of just running away from them. Um, And we know this now as as interoception, the ability to to have physiological listening. And those physiological sounds are directly connected to the emotional centers of your brain in many cases, and certainly in in, in my case. So every morning I would roll up a hand towel and then I would sort of bundle it up and make it into the size of a hamburger bun. Or in the U.S., we have something called a honey bun, or actually in the South, which is where I'm from. We used to eat those delicious cinnamon buns called honey buns. And so um, I would lay on that every morning before I did my morning practice in the dorm room with my roommate, Bita, sleeping in, in the top bunk, passed out from doing too much organic chem. And thus really began my introspective journey into how self-massage could help me to emotionally regulate myself. And then that turned into, I was in massage school, like I told you, I was studying shiatsu, which is Japanese acupressure. I then met my mentor, his name is Glenn Black, when I went to work at the Omega Institute for Holistic Studies in between summers during college. And Glenn trained me in his yoga methodology, as well as his hands-on bodywork techniques called body tuning which is incredible, and that actually comes from a, a physio in New York City named Shmuel Tots. But really what happened is when I left Glenn after many years of working with him and I moved out to LA, I needed to find body work the way I was trained in and the way, the way Glenn worked on me. I couldn't find anybody that I felt matched the completeness of, of uh, manual therapy. And so I started experimenting with lots of different props including, like you said, tennis balls. Actually, I never use lacrosse balls. I always tended towards uh, softer tools because of the way it interplayed with the myofascias of my body and allowed me to do joint play. Harder tools are uh, very uncomfortable and rather destructive when you're getting them into or approximating joint spaces. And so softer tools were, were the way to go. And then Fast forward, now we're hydroplaning like as quickly as possible. I met my now husband. He saw what I was doing. He said, we need to bottle this. You need to teach this on mass. And then I wrote a book and, you know, and I'm talking to you. (laughs) All that good stuff. So I not only want you to describe your balls, but I would love for you to just also describe what is it about ball therapy that they can get to that massage, shiatsu, or any other, you know, kind of modality involving a person can't get to? What's so special about the balls? Oh, wow. Okay. So there's two, those are two completely different, huge questions. Actually, there's like three or four questions in there. (laughs) In in terms of the, the ball technology, these are very simple tools. They're very inexpensive tools. We make tools that anybody can play with. There's no barrier to entry. I think the, the smallest balls are called the yoga tune-up balls, and I think they're $12. All of our balls, we have four different sizes. There's the yoga tune-up therapy balls, which are a little smaller than a tennis ball, the plus balls, which are a little larger than a lacrosse ball. There's an alpha ball. There's the inflated, air-filled, gorgeous ball, which is our gut and rib cage ball much better than a sandbag that I used to use or a rolled up towel. All of the balls are made from grippy, pliable rubber. And this is the differentiating factor from a lot of tools that are out there on the marketplace. The balls have a ton of grip. And that's important because when the balls touch your skin, it basically sticks to it like rubber Velcro. And the balls are able to create transition from layer to layer to layer because it keeps taking a hold of that top layer. So what this does is it creates tissue shear. Shear is the action of being able to move 
objects across each other in a horizontal vector. And so you have the ball pressing in and also transitioning tissues from the top down. And so it really mimics the hands of, of a skilled manual therapist who works without oil. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. One thing quickly that popped up for me as you're explaining, does the person have to have these directly on the skin? Obviously they can, but if they're wearing like a t-shirt, is, is that still fine? That's a great question. What happens is because the balls have so much grip, it ends up making your fabric a grip transfer medium, meaning the grip of the ball ends up toothing its way into cottons, certain lycras, even wools, and that the tissue, the, rather the fabric will will grab you in the same way as the ball. Certain fabrics won't, and they're not a good sort of grip transfer medium, like um, biking shorts. It's just too, they're too thick with the lycra. So yeah, your fabric does matter, and different performance clothing works better than others. What we try to tell our people is skin for the win, <laughs> skin for the win if you can. So we do you know, suggest rolling in as few layers as possible. Because if you have multiple layers of clothing, then you're actually going to be, the ball is going to create a sliding effect with your multiple layers. So if you have one layer, it's great. If you have no layers, even better. So that's what we would recommend. There's obviously some parts of your body where you would not want to put the ball directly. We do pelvic floor work. I mean, specifically setting the ball on the perineum, and you would definitely want to have a layer of fabric there. You don't want to put the ball directly on your pelvic floor. So that would be one of our exceptions. But, you know, I've got good curtains in my own practice studio, and I definitely have been known to roll in the buff, so to speak. <laughs> um, so, and it's never not funny, Jesse, when you're talking about balls, right? Yeah, I wonder how many ball... Uh times balls is going to come up in the in the chat. <laughs> well, I just try to keep it really rated G. And whatever however you interpret it is how you interpret it. And we just we just let that just eat there in the universe. Uh, I'm <laughs> I love ball jokes. So, I was talking about the properties of the balls. The balls have this amazing amount uh, ability to create shear. There's some more technical stuff about that in terms of how it is excellent for hastening perfusion in tissues, meaning it, when the ball does that grippy thing, it drags water in to your tissues. It helps to create a better estuarial flow, so to speak, in your tissues. And also that grip, that shear excites a whole host of very specialized nerve endings, which we'll probably get to maybe later when we talk about proprioception. The other property of the balls that's critical is that they are springy. They yield. They're pliable. They're not dense, hard rubber. When you first get them, they actually are quite firm, but they break down. They should break down. They're designed to break down so that when you're rolling against bony prominences, which are all over your body, these aren't designed to just be stuck into the belly of a muscle. You should be able to tour your knee. You should be able to go along your spine. You should be able to go on delicate facial muscles all over your feet and so on. That when the ball comes into a bony prominence, the bony prominence tucks into the pliability of the ball. So the ball can enrobe itself around that prominence and do work on the tissue surrounding the prominence. When you have harder objects like lacrosse balls or dense foam rollers, you cannot get into these little tiny nooks and crannies, these very delicate regions in and around joints. Those harder objects will pinch. They won't have the ability to mold into these tissues. And so you continuously bypass them, this very, very valuable tissue area. So the balls are grippy, they're pliable, and they're portable. It's hard to take your foam roller with you on a plane. They can go anywhere in your gym bag, in your purse. We have them everywhere, all over our house. We love them. <laughs> we have one in uh, the car. Actually, Jill, yeah. when Marnie and her were on a road trip, she brought it out there and it's just stayed there since. So you just got to you got to watch out. It doesn't fly out and uh, roll under the pedal. But yeah, it's it's a great way to get your rolling in. Most definitely. Jill, I think an important thing for us to do before we get any further in is describe some of the different kinds of tissue that are being affected by this rolling. 
So let's mm-hmm. talk about muscle, fascia, nerves. What are the different structures that are being affected by this, this procedure? By the procedure. <laughs> well, this is rubber surgery after all. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it is. These are like little rubber scalpels and they affect everything. So, I mean, we have the, the larger ball, the gorgeous ball, specifically to stimulate your viscera. We have the smaller balls to be able to um, get into very, very fine muscles or myofascial continuities on the body. So let's describe just some base anatomy here. You are, good, goodness, you are a biological organism that is you know, deeply controlled by your nervous tissue, and that's your brain, your brain stem. You have layers of soft tissue. So I'm going to skip a lot of the other stuff, but you have layers of soft tissues that include muscles, fascial tissues, ligaments, tendons that all work together to attach to your bony structure so that your bony structure and your nervous system can move through space, get food, eat food, have sex, do its thing. So when the balls are rolling on you, of course, they're rolling on everything. You you can't touch an object to your body without touching skin, pressure into nerves, mushing around vasculature, and mushing around your, your muscles or your myofascias. Now, I think where people may get confused is, well, what is fascia? I've heard this fascia, that fascia, and what is myofascia versus what is muscle? Maybe it would help if I illustrate or talk about the differences of that. Especially fascia. That's That seems to be one that more and more is being talked about in the health literature. And it'd be great to hear your explanation for everybody. Great. Well, I think one of the easiest ways to conceptualize fascia is to, whether you're a vegetarian or not right now, I'm going I'm to take you to the meat counter. And when you're looking at different meats, you'll see some white filmy tissue overlying whatever muscle meat you're looking at. And I'm not talking about the fatty layer, although the fat is in of itself a type of fascia. It's called superficial fascia. But if you remember eating chicken, or chicken breast at some point, or maybe eating skinning a chicken, when you pull off the fatty layer, there's this very thin snappy membrane overlying the breast or overlying the thigh. It's probably the easiest to see on those larger pieces that also might have a few uh, veins or, or nerves threaded through it, and it's translucent. Does this sound familiar to you, Jesse, Marnie? Yeah, no, for sure. That's, that's a good way of uh, visualizing, yes. Great. So you are like that. You're a biological organism, just like chicken or just like lamb, and you have these different densities of fascial tissues that enrobe every single muscle that you have, but the fascial tissues also entwine or encircle every muscle cell that you have and bundles of muscle cells. Your body has a seam system that helps tie everything together from bone to organ, through and wrapping around your nervous system, around your uh, blood vessels, around the multiple layers within a given muscle, all the way to your skin. So this seam system, I refer to it as a seam system, is your, your fascial system. And within your, your, your fascia is, is a, so you can think of it as a soft tissue scaffolding. It's, it's how your muscles become what they are. They need this structure in order to fill in. If you look at an orange, and in my book, The Role Model, I have actually a whole chapter on fascia, and I think it's a very easy chapter to help understand the concept of this this type of connective tissue called fascia. Um, if you look at an orange slice, sometimes looking at an orange slice makes it easy. Also, when you peel open the orange slice, you know you you break the membrane, the sort of thicker membrane, and then you see all those cute little cute little juicy cells. Each one of those juicy cells has its own little packet of thin membranous tissue wrapping around it. And if you squeeze it, juice just comes out. Well, that thin membranous tissue is exactly analogous to the thinnest uh, layer of connective tissue, of fascial tissue wrapping around an individual muscle cell. 
and then when you look at that, when you break open the orange, you can see that these little orange cells are actually connected to one another and they're connected to the pod that they're in. And then that pod is connected to the next pod. And all those pods are connected to the fluffy white pith surrounding the whole orange. And then that's connected to the, the orange skin with the oils and the delicious smell. You're like that too, except you're made of collagen and not cellulose. That's the difference. So we have these unifying organizing principles uh, that are just biological, but you're a mammalian, you're not a piece of fruit, right? Yeah. Well, thanks for that visual. That really helps. You know, I'm a, I'm a visual person and I need to see it to believe it. So that really, really helps. I've learned to think visually. I'm a tactile person completely. And it's been writing the book has, that's been one of the best lessons for me is being able to develop visual, visual um, analogies, especially over the podcast or over the airwaves. How do you, how do you give somebody the impression of their connective tissue just through your voice? Well, here's something you can do right now because I want to take you through the layers of fascia you have in your body. One is the fatty layer. It's really easy to find. In fact, if you take your fingers and pinch your forearm right now, not deep into the muscle, but just pinch the skin and the buoyant tissue underneath that, that's called superficial fascia. Are you guys pinching that? Yes. Got a hold. Now keep a hold of it and then try to slide it down, up, or side to side. Can you feel how it moves to a degree? Yeah, for sure. It probably moves more in one direction than another. If you twist it or wring it, it also has movement. Now, the reason this, um, y- your skin is mobile and the connective tissue underneath it, the superficial fascia, very, very mobile. And it has the ability to slide like this or to, to move, to transition over the next layer of fascia. So the next layer of fascia underneath your superficial fascia is called deep fascia. And deep fascia looks super organized. It's very thin, but it's very taut. It, uh, a lot of times people will describe it as sausage casing or duct tape or saran wrap. That deep fascia is that membranous thing that you pulled off of the chicken that was like translucent and springy and looked, it actually had a lot of integrity to it. Your superficial fascia slides over the deep fascia vis-a-vis another layer called loose fascia or some people at the, the most recent fascia congress in DC a couple months ago um, calls this an interface. So it's where the fatty layer meets the deep layer. And this is important. The ability for your soft tissues to slide is super important because this is actually analogous to what should be happening within your muscles themselves. Remember how I was talking about the wrapping around each of these muscle cells and the muscle cells connecting into the pod and whatnot? Your muscle cells should be able to have mobility relative to their neighboring muscle cells. And when those start to stiffen, we start to get clumps of non-moving or the disabled contractile fibers within muscle cells and groups of muscle cells. We start to get these trigger points. We start to get stiffness. We start to get immobilized. We start to get pain. So the ability for your this sort of gross analogy of, oh, my, my fat forearm tissue can move over the deep fascia, that's also happening at micro and macro levels within your muscles. So if we go underneath the deep fascia, your deep fascia is surrounding your muscles. But the better, more appropriate term for your muscles is myofascia. And that is the combination of muscle and fascia. Every muscle you have has this organization of little tiny cells wrapped with fascia, groups of muscle cells bundled together into something called a fascicle, or you could call it a fascicle, and then fascicles clumped together to form the larger tissue of myofascia. So you cannot have muscle without fascia, although you can have fascia without muscle. Okay. Well, that's a great way of uh, breaking it down for us. And now that we have a, a hold of the anatomy, you have the various layers of fascia, you have the fascia that is actually running through the muscle, comprising the myofascia, and we also have tendons, ligaments. So these are the various structures that somebody using the balls is going to be affecting. Let's talk about what happens to the tissues when, say, we're not using our bodies or when we're not living a healthy lifestyle, what happens to these tissues that requires us getting in there and stretching things out? Well, what I described to you was a very 
musculoskeletal analysis. What I didn't mention is the the number of other systems that are woven into your fascia, your nervous system, your blood vessel, your vascular system, your lymphatic system, all uses your fascia as a highway to get from one place to another. So when you're rolling on therapy balls, you're rolling on your integrated body. Although we use the therapy balls to help de-stiffen and improve mobility between layers or in local regions that are not moving appropriately for that region. I think one of the common, you know, common uses of the therapy balls are I'm very stiff in a tissue, so I'm going to rub this in order to soften it up, you know, improve the the fluid perfusion there and hopefully reintegrate this tissue into my my movement pattern. That stiffness may create pain, and so people use the, the therapy balls for pain reduction. One of my favorite ways of using the therapy balls is to enhance proprioception because the therapy balls, because of their shear and the, the type of pressure they give, they are sort of a perfect tool to excite nerve endings that are all over your body, sensory nerve endings that are all over your body called proprioceptors. And these proprioceptors give your brain its map of itself. And so by rolling, you improve your body's ability to sense itself to better coordinate. And I think that people who have more coordination tend to be less accident and injury prone. So there's lots of different benefits to this. And then the one that I like to come back to is how I started. I needed a way to cool down my mind. I needed a way to be able to feel safe, nurtured, and cared for in a way that I just wasn't getting environmentally. And so I gave it to myself through self-massage. So fascinating. And different ways of using the ball. Obviously, you have videos and all kinds of guides on this. So staying stagnant and opening up a certain area versus rolling around, you know, someone's just getting started. What's a great way just to kind of get your body used to the balls? Yeah. (laughs) Getting used to the balls. I, I like to say you should go to the perimeter first. So our Our big go-to is the feet. Everybody, everybody can use some foot care for sure. Our the soles of our feet, our feet take a beating from footwear, from you know, lack of diversity of texture underneath our feet. So putting the balls underneath your feet, standing near a wall or a chair so that you maintain your balance, you know, gosh forbid if the ball decides to to roll away, um, will help to develop the grip of the balls because they, when you first get them, they're a little bit slick. As soon as you start to use them, their grippiness shows up as does that pliability. So it's one of the best ways to break down your balls is to stand on them and to smush them around. And then secondly, my other big thing for people is to get them on your spine. <sighs> the, our spines have become like environmentally and culturally so deformed because of our tendency to be seated or a tendency to be looking at computers and devices. And so this is a way to refresh your birthright in in your posture, which is also to be able to breathe into the circumference of your diaphragm and not just a portion of your diaphragm, your chief breathing muscle. So I like to to get people on their spine as quickly as possible. Um, And if laying down on the ground is too much pressure, uh, leaning against the wall So those are kind of like some of the first two places I'll go. And then the other place that I like to go or encourage anyone to go because I know they're not going there is their abdomen. And using the gorgeous ball on the abdomen and rib cage is one of the most invaluable ways to train your breathing so that you're breathing correctly and to literally press reset on your nervous system and enjoy literally a, min- a mini vacation inside your own body from the spinning, the, the unconscious spinning going on inside your head. And I want to mention too, for the listeners, the gorgeous ball is softer. That's one that you actually blow up and it's the largest of the set, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. And you can put as much air or you know, have half air in it, just depending on the amount of pressure that you can tolerate. Mm-hmm. Sure. And we have the alpha balls here, right? Like in front of the TV in our living room area. 
earlier this morning, I was rolling out my feet and yeah, that I can vouch for that feels really great, especially after you get the blood flowing in there, do it for a couple of minutes and it's a good kind of tenderness in the beginning and then it ju- your body just gets used to it and it feels fantastic. I'm doing it right now, actually. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> nice. And I also want to make the point that when we're affecting one area of the body by doing the rolling, because of that connection we talked about earlier, the fascia running through the body, we're actually having an effect on other areas. So it's not just isolated to the feet when you're rubbing the feet or to the abdomen when you're on that area. You're having an effect on the tissue surrounding as well. Oh, absolutely. Your your neighboring tissues will have a reciprocal release from that. So one of the things we say in all the yoga tune-up trainings is act local, feel global. By rolling the feet, you will be shocked to find out that your hip flexion increases. Mysteriously, your hamstrings and your calves uh, feel longer. Your The same side of your back will feel longer. And the, sort of the classic thing is to roll a foot, do a forward bend, and you'll feel that one side feels tight and the other side feels open. The side that you just roll feels open. But in our trainings, I go over this phenomenon in a lot of detail. And we do a lot of different scenarios where you can actually have a clip that I did on the Oprah Winfrey network of rolling out your thumb and how it changes shoulder range of motion and neck pain. I mean, it's so crazy how you can work in these distal places, but because of the fascial seams, because of those fascial relationships, it impacts neighboring or even distant structures that are fascially related to the the tissue target that you were rolling. So interesting. And I want to talk about, well, there's all different kinds of sizes of balls, including the therapy balls that I know you can sit on. I, in fact, actually have one. The big, the big giant ones that everyone exercises on, you can get it on a little roller and sit on it. And this also ties into sitting. But what are your thoughts on those as, as a chair device? Because I know a lot of people are getting into it. I got suckered into it and I'm feeling it now in my hips. So now I'm realizing that I can't use it for a chair, but I, I'm happy to use it for a back bend. Um, so just since we're talking about balls of all different kinds of sizes, I just want to know if you can just express opinion on that because it is a bit of a fad slash phase. I would love to express my opinion on that. And and thank you for asking me. No one has ever asked me, although I've definitely sort of gone off about it before. I love physio balls for doing different proprioceptive challenges, um, for back bends, for different breathing exercises. But for sitting, I think they're really kind of a terrible device. And the reason is, is that when you sit on the apex of those physio balls, and we're talking about the physio balls that are, you know, 55 centimeter, 65 centimeter, 75 centimeter, right? Yes. Okay. So when you sit on the apex of that ball, the apex of that ball sinks, right? So you're not sitting on a firm structure. You're not sitting on a wooden pew in church, which actually makes you, which actually is a really good thing to sit on. I love wooden stools. I love the floor. I do not like sitting on physio balls because when you sit on it and Your ischial tuberosities, those are the two bones at the bottom of your pelvis, they cannot find ground. And when they cannot find ground, your pelvic floor recruits itself in the most bizarre way, as does your lower back, as do your buttocks. You're sinking. And so because you're sinking, you also need to swim to safety. The other thing that happens is if you're about to give birth to a child, great, sit on a physio ball because when you sit on a physio ball, your pelvic floor distends. It stretches, it lengthens to like extraordinary levels. If anybody has ever had pelvic floor dysfunction and you sit on an airplane seat or a physio ball, it is like one of the the worst things ever because you will probably leak. If you have tears in your pelvic floor, those tears will be stretched. And I know this just sounds horrible, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. But uh, if you have hemorrhoids, This is another way to irritate your hemorrhoids because there's no internal support anymore. Everything is just falling through. And so your hip flexors, like you said, they're getting sore because they're firing like crazy to keep you upright because everything else is getting shut off. 
So the goal of them was for abs, right? That was kind of the, the marketing tool used for them is that it keeps your core engaged and you're kind of working your core while you sit. Is that kind of what <laughs> what people are believing is happening? But I, all these other secondary things are happening at the same well, time. Well, if your hip flexors are your core, then yes. <laughs> but they're not. You're, I mean, there is no core. Right. Uh, so that's a, a total cultural definition. I use the word core all the time, but you have to re- define it. You have to say what you mean by that. So as your pelvis prolapses into the physio ball, Other structures, like I said, are having to swim to shore, are fighting to stay alive to keep you upright. And so you're overworking certain tissues. Other tissues are being ridiculously stretched with strain. And I'm just not a fan. But I use them for other reasons. Right. Well, I fell into the trap and it, I started repositioning. I started straddling the ball and putting, if I could describe this, putting my legs behind me so my hips are actually open and mm-hmm. I'm almost squeezing the ball with my legs and sitting upright just to open up my hips to counteract it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but now I just keep it off to the side and I go on to, to a stretch. But let's talk about sitting since we're talking about it and how, what it's doing to our body, our posture, our shape, our butts. Let's, uh, let's get into this. This is a big you know, problem of our society these days. So how can we change this? Yeah. My, my friends, Kelly and Juliet Starrett have a website called standupkids.org and they have a, a pilot program going on in their, in their daughter's elementary school where they, they've replaced all of the, the desks with standing desks for kids. And they have compiled on their website, dozens and dozens and dozens of resources uh, that, you should take a look at, anybody should take a look at. My friend Katie Bowman as well just put out a book called Don't Just Sit There. So I refer, I defer to them immediately as uh, having cataloged a lot more data on this than I do, but I certainly have lots of data on it as well. So the thing about sitting is it impacts your spine, it impacts your muscles of respiration, it dampens and depresses your physiology. There's lots of studies done on this. This is why sitting is called the new smoking. It is it is a danger to our bodies. The World Health Organization says that physical inactivity is the fourth leading cause of death on the planet. Fourth leading cause of death on the planet is physical inactivity, right? That's crazy. And where is all this physical inactivity happening? Probably not while standing. It's happening while sitting. So go read some studies and then I'll just tell you a couple of of things. Since I was going on about your pelvic floor and kind of your butt, let's talk about your butt for a second. When you're sitting, are you guys standing right now or are you sitting? We're kind of shuffling around, but (laughs) sitting. I actually just just kneeled down on the floor and opened up my hips with my leg back. So, (laughs) (laughs) Okay. What about you? Are you you standing? Yeah, I'm standing. I, I wrote my... You know, actually, I wrote my book, The Role Model, while standing, except when I was on flights. So, yeah, I'm kind of a standing desk. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm obsessed with um, movement. Um, okay, so getting back to <laughs> sitting. So when you're sitting on your bottom, are your buttocks contracting or are they lengthening? Your buttocks are lengthening. lengthening. Correct. So when you're sitting you're in a prolonged stretch of your tush. Now, is stretching all day good for you or is stretching all day bad for you? Think about, think about if you stretched your hip flexors all day, like the hip flexors you're trying to lengthen, Marnie, think about holding a hip flexor stretch for eight to 10 hours. They'd open up too much. <laughs> they, would, they would open up and they would start to, to fray, mm-hmm. right? It would be so much excessive stretching on those tissues that they would become dysfunctional. It's like a ridiculous proposition, right? Like, no, who would do that? But we do that with our butt while sitting. When you're squatting, when you're squatting, you're actually in any any eccentric load. So there is some contraction happening to keep you upright. But when you're sitting, you don't need to. All of your, your, your load is offloaded on the chair that you're sitting in. And depending on how the chair is designed, whether your knees are higher than your pelvis or knees are lower than your pelvis, will impact the degree of that stretch. But when you're stretching for excessive periods of time, the fascial tissues from the cell to the bundles around the cells to the, the larger, deeper fascias surrounding the whole of the muscle get excessively lengthened. And when too much of that length happens, the the muscle tissue within them also become too lengthened and they lose their ability to contract well. 
And because they lose their ability to contract well, and because the fascial tissues are overstretched, by the time you stand up from sitting for five years, 10 years, 20, 30, 50 years of your life, these tissues are so overstretched that the muscle doesn't fire on axis very well. Your coxal joint, your hip joint is designed to propel you forward with walking. But when your tissues are, have become flaccid and in the training community, they're calling this gluteal amnesia. When your tissues have become dumbed from the pressure and the rigors of overstretching through sitting, you have a dysfunctional gait. Your walking pattern is your primal movement pattern besides breathing. And you can see the whole host of problems that that will create. And then if you're into aesthetics, or let's call it aesthetics, by the time you stood up, your ass is no longer on your ass. It's fallen slightly off to the side because of its overstretchedness. You're saying that we can get nice tight tushies from standing more. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm <laughs> in it. And I'll, let me just semantics correction here. I'm not into tight anything. I'm into buoyant, fluffy balanced tissues that contract well, that can lengthen well, and that can be at rest well. So you want to have your muscles firing correctly, given any, any, any objective that you're after, whether it's walking, whether it's lifting, whether it's holding some type of you know, static yoga pose. But yeah, you're going to be, have a more fit tush if you stand correctly, but also if you use your butt correctly in the context of movement in life. Okay. So Somebody makes the upgrade, they get a standing desk. Is that the only option? And is standing all day a good thing? Or do you recommend switching from seating to standing and vice versa? What's the ideal for somebody that's, they know they have to make a change right now? What, what would you recommend? Well, if you stand all day, then standing too much becomes your new RSI, your new repetitive stress. And any new exercise, <laughs> whether it's standing or running or whatever, you should you, you want to scale it. So if you're just deciding, like, I'm going to get a standing desk, you should probably include periods of sitting, periods of laying down. I'll work on my computer uh, laying down on the floor. I'll sometimes lay on the couch on my back, but mostly standing. And when I stand, I'll do different varieties of things. I'll put my foot up on a neighboring chair or a counter. I'll do different stretches with my hips. Um, I'll contract and relax. I'll come up and down on my toes, do calf raises. I'll massage my feet with the therapy balls. I try to take breaks. So I take walks. I can't take a walk right now. I would love to talk to you guys on a walk, but I'm chained to my computer with my headphones. So my friend, uh, Katie Bowman, she talks a lot about movement variety. And I think that that's key during your workday is that, you know, you take your computer, hopefully you have a laptop, you can take it down to the floor, you can try different sits on the floor, you can try different types of standing, like I just mentioned, with different um, mobilizations or activations. And that's exactly, intuitively, that's what my body does, just because I get so uncomfortable sitting in one spot. But it's so funny in my workspace, which is a kitchen, because I teach cooking classes, my assistant Ooh. will laugh at me because I'll just be standing in the kitchen, I'll be talking to her, and then all of a sudden I'll throw my leg up on the counter and start leaning forward and just talking. She starts laughing. But to me, it's so natural. It's just like my body just needs to move. And mm -hmm. it's it just feels so right. So yeah, if there's anything we can just encourage our uh, listeners here, just move <laughs> throughout yeah. the day. Yeah, it feels so good. And we actually had Katie Bowman on the show, and that's exactly what she was stating too. Just moving throughout the day, keep that body moving, keep things circulating. And yeah, just good to hear that again. Yeah. And I think I think that, you know, one of the things that I'm super interested in and is also the breath mechanics as they're impacted by sitting. And although you have generations of mystical art that shows people in seated meditation, you know, quite happy and quite content, you know, sitting, uh, sitting med meditation practices aren't necessarily the most ideal position for optimizing your diaphragm if you're sitting with your spine not in a, like impeccable position. So I think that there's a big component of diaphragm training and breath training that needs to be addressed in the context of this discussion on standing as well. Because you standing 
and leaning into one hip is just as bad as you sitting all day as well in terms of the bizarre loads going into the core corsature muscles of your body and those respiratory tissues. This is a much larger discussion, but we shouldn't leave it out. Right. Let's talk more about the breath. That's come up a couple of times here. So a lot of us are chronically breathing shallow, just breathing into the upper chest. What have you noticed with people when you start working with them? What areas end up contracting up when somebody isn't taking those deep breaths and what should people be doing to to work on, say, the diaphragm or other muscles to facilitate deeper, fuller breaths? Yeah, parsing out breathing. You have three zones primarily where you breathe. You have the abdominal region, you have the thoracic region, which is your rib cage region, and then you have your clavicular region. Abdominal breathing is the most sedating of breathing styles. And it's when your diaphragm, which is a, a parachute shaped muscle that lines the lower six ribs of your body and hooks into your lumbar spine. It also shares very strong fascial attachments into some very profound postural muscles. One is called the psoas. Another is called the quadratus lumborum. Um, and another is called the transversus abdominis. So abdominal breathing is the most relaxing type of breathing that you can do. Thoracic breathing occurs in the ribs. and You need to have ribs that move well in order for thoracic breathing to occur. In thoracic breathing, the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles interrelate in order to mobilize the ribs laterally. That means they you balloon your ribs outward when you breathe. When you do abdominal breathing, your gut balloons. When you do thoracic breathing, your ribs balloon. You need to do thoracic breathing while you're training, when you're doing exercise, because uh, you need to brace your, your abdomen, essentially. You need to create a, a soft tissue ring in the abdomen so that your lower back spine is protected. And in order to do that, you're going to be cutting off, you siphon off the ability for your diaphragm to move down very well. And so it will translate into thoracic breathing. This brings me to the third zone of breathing. Clavicular breathing. Clavicular breathing happens neck to collarbone. And it's the type of breathing you see in people in panic, in stress. You know, at the end of a race, hands go to the thighs, your head just falls down, shoulders hiked up to the ears. That's the that's clavicular breathing. And I call this the stress breath. Unfortunately, many of the muscles, and it's it's you don't really need it unless you're in an emergency. But unfortunately, because I believe of our postural, our cultural postural problem of too much sitting and our heads hanging off axis, our neck and head uh, um, being dragged towards gravity instead of being held upright because of staring at computers, staring at devices, we've inappropriately already pre-recruited dozens of stress muscles of respiration just for posture. And so when people are exercising, They've already glided through that unconscious pattern. It's become a cement, it's become cemented in them. And so what I see is the translation of proper thoracic breathing into an inappropriate recruitment of those stress muscles of respiration. And this is extremely stressful on your nervous system. It's extremely stressful on your neck bones. And so I see more and more neck problems and jaw problems now and eye problems because of this this whole inner relationship. Does that make sense? I mean, I just talked about 15 topics in one. <laughs> no, it's great. I guess for somebody that knows they haven't been breathing properly, where do they start? How do they start breathing well? And are the balls, are they part of the process of loosening things up and getting those patterns back? One billion percent. So when I first work with people and they tell me about what's going on, no matter who I work with, whether it's a foot injury, a wrist injury, a neck injury, or complaint, I have to bring them to their breath. I've got to get the access of breathing impeccable. Every single person I work with needs to retrain their breathing, or at least needs to be to literally re-inspire their breathing. And so the gorgeous ball goes in the gut, the gorgeous ball goes on the rib cage. Right now, I've been developing a lot of new neck training for my students since I just keep seeing these patterns. And so 
I've got a new, a couple of new workshops coming out that are very neck focused as it relates to core. And, you know, I just, it bums me out that we have, we're, I don't, I feel like as a, as a society, we're not getting closer to solving our health crisis because of technology. We're crippling ourselves with technology just because we want to check up the next idea that comes into our head. Well, let me look that up on Google on my phone. And you're like, boom, head goes down. Like those things add up. Ask Katie about it. Yeah. And then you typically get caught up into Facebook or social media and one thing leads to the next. So yeah, you can definitely head down the rabbit hole and and lead to all kinds of different problems. One thing I want to get to here before we wrap up talking about the balls is for people at home, is there things around the house that they can use to start doing some of this muscle work? Like you mentioned earlier, the yoga tune-up balls are really inexpensive. I think the whole set is 50 some dollars on your website. So everybody should go out, make that investment. But for people to be able to start incorporating this stuff right away after the show, what kind of instruments would they have around the home that they could start using? You've got stuff all over the place. You've got um, water bottles. You have probably dog toys. You have sports balls. You can use these objects on your body. Couch. I have done so much self-massage on the ends of, you know, armchairs and sofas, towels. You can use towels to create tremendous shear as long as it doesn't irritate you too much. What else? I'm just looking around my office right now and looking at different objects. So basically just grinding things to your tolerance into your different muscles and soft tissues. Yeah. And I think, I think the best instruction I can give your listeners, I'm even looking, I have a plastic clipboard over there. That would be a great thing to, you know, it's like I can't roll on it. I'd have to use my own body force, my hands to to sort of mush it into my thighs. And one of the things I love about the therapy balls is you don't need to contort yourself to service yourself. You just lay down and create positions where the balls can get into the tissues. So I like to create passive positions that give you the massage. And there's reasons for that. Talk about it in the book. Um, so I won't bore you here. But here's what I can tell your listeners. When you're using any object, your objective is to tune in to your own physiological listening. And so that means you want to stretch your tissues with whatever tool you're using only to the point where you feel a slight soft pinch, not an aggressive pinch, but a slight soft pinch. And when you hit that, that is technically called your stretch barrier. And you only need to apply about three to 6% of pressure to hit that stretch barrier. And it's at that stretch barrier that you stay, or you can do a variety of different techniques. I have free videos that describe nine different techniques we use in the role model um, on my YouTube channel apply the different techniques at that stretch barrier. And then once the sensation of that gentle pinch dissipates, move on to another point. So you can use any tool to identify and isolate that stretch barrier. And that's exactly what any great manual therapist will do when they're working on you. They'll duck their fingers into your tissue. They'll slide your tissue um, a certain direction, this way or that, and they'll probably hold. Or they'll do some little dwiddly things, not little dwiddly things, but important dwiddly things that help to excite tissue regeneration or breaking up tissue in that area. And that's, that's really all you need to do. Yeah. As a chiropractor, I do active release and practice and the results on patients, I use it on everybody. It's profound doing the grab and pinch and, and movement of the tissue. So glad you brought that up. Yeah. And I love that you said grab and pinch too, because I think one of the things that a concept that probably a lot of people aren't walking around with is that they are dimensional. Like you're not just muscles that are ironed onto your bones. You are, you're fluffy and you want to, you, know, you want to fluff your body. Like you fluff a sofa, you know, you, wanna, you don't want your down feathers to be all compressed and kind of, you know, oiled up and shellacked. You want to be able to have loft and so technically this is called offloading. So when you're using the grip of the therapy balls, there's a technique we do called skin rolling. Really it's about plucking. It's about fluffing. It's about 
improving your three dimensionality. You're not just you know rolling to make your pizza dough flatter and make your pizza dough wider. You're kneading and compressing in order to add volume to yourself. Mm, sounds good. I really want a massage right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, get down and roll. Mike. I know. I'm gonna. I'm definitely gonna get down on the floor after this. Um, so what we're gonna do, Jill, is we're gonna go into a rapid fire question round and ask you a <gasps> okay. whole bunch of things, and you just just go off the cusp, whatever comes to mind. All right. So the first one is, what are two things you do in the morning to get your day started? I'm guessing. Uh, I'm guessing one of them. <laughs> well, one one is coffee. Nice. Bulletproof? Um, no. My no, not sometimes. Like if we have guests here, sometimes they'll make us the bulletproof. But no, I'm like I'm old fashioned, I guess, or I haven't adapted to it yet, or I haven't committed to it yet. I love it. But uh, my husband and I, we get this coffee from uh, Jason Ferruja called Renegade Roast. And we just make our regular coffee with half and half with it. I sound so boring. But the other thing I do, the other thing I do to get my day going, Marnie, and this is the thing that gets me out of bed. This is the thing that gets me in bed is I go and I wake up my daughter. She's woken up. She's 21 months old. And I spend about an hour with her in and out of her crib, playing in her room. That's why it's important for me to have my coffee. (laughs) So that I run down, I get her bottle, I get my coffee and I go up. And I play with her for about an hour. And that's the most sacred time of my morning routine. So special. So special. I love that. And then you go roll, right? <laughs> the rolling happens at some point in the morning. Yes. Okay, Jill, what makes you feel most alive? Being with my daughter. Love it. What is your favorite snack on the go? It's some, some form of dark chocolate. Uh, I'm with you with that. No goji berries, please. Do not put goji berries or acai in my... I just want the chocolate. Do you have a brand that you like? Um, Nibmore is what I'm really into right now. N-I-B-M-O-R. Okay. We'll uh, put that in the show notes with everything else we talked about today at uh, ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Jill, J-I-L-L. So that's that's a brand I'm not familiar with. What about you, Marn? No, but I think I've seen it in the States. I don't think we have it here in Canada, like many other things. <laughs> it'll come. We often get it a little bit later, but it'll come. So what is one thing that most people don't know about you? I started as a trained singer. That's how I learned about my diaphragm. It's so funny that you ask that. I was, I've been in a process of purging files and doing December cleaning, very overdue December cleaning. And I had a file in my filing cabinet today called Music. And I, I just don't even remember that it was there. And I pulled it out and there was sheet music from... Oh my gosh, just decades. And I just started weeping. The whole reason I I have the programming I do and the passion I have about breathing, a big part of it is because I learned to breathe when I was very, very young. I learned about my diaphragm and posture for vocal production. Very interesting. Well, thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite vacation spot? (laughs) First of all, that means you take vacations. Hmm. Dream travel place. We really love Kona. Love it. Okay, nice. I haven't been there, but uh, oh. it's on the list, so yeah, for sure. Okay, Jill, in wrapping up, one thing we ask all the guests before they leave the show is, what is one healthy habit we can implement right away after the show? Stand with your feet under your lungs, get your rib cage over your pelvis and your skull over your rib cage, and then fill from the basin of your pelvis all the way to your throat without hiking your shoulders up. Enlarge the lining of your birthday suit with your breath while standing in impeccable posture. Ah, it sounds nice. We'll have to try that right after uh, our chat here. Awesome. Great way to end. Thank you so much, Jill. This has been a blast. Where can our listeners go to connect with you after the show? You can find me on social media at Yoga Tune Up on Facebook. Also Jill Miller on Facebook. Instagram, Yoga Tune Up, Twitter, Yoga Tune Up, and then my website, yogatuneup.com, or you can go to therolemodel.com to find out more about the book and purchase through Amazon. Great. And we'll have all that linked up again in the show notes. So ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Jill. Again, Jill, thank you so much. You've left us with so much great information here, and I'm excited to to get on the ball like we talked about before right after this because I've learned a whole bunch here so I'm sure the listeners have as well 
Well, thank you so much for having me. It was really a pleasure. Yeah, it was great. And you know what? If our listeners can just get a little bit more connected to their body, it's uh, it's amazing. So this was great. Thank you. Well, if they're if they're Canadian, which I'm sure a lot of them are, we have dozens of yoga tune-up teachers throughout Canada. They can just go to our website and find them. Okay, great. So check it out, guys. And Jill, make sure uh, when you're in the area, you give us a heads up and we'll We'll take you out to a nice, healthy restaurant here in uh, Toronto. I'll see you guys at the yoga conference probably in April. There you go. Looking forward to it. Okay, Jill, have a great one and thanks again. Take care. Take care. Bye. So I hope you guys loved that interview with Jill Miller as much as we did. What a great chat. So much information. Be sure to go and get the Habits app like we talked about in the opening. It's going to help you to organize all this information you're gathering on the show and all the other health information that you gather through your reading, through your online venturing. So all you need to do is go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash habits, $2 right now, go and get yourself a copy. Yeah, and we're so excited to hear and see the habits you guys are implementing. So follow along the hashtag Habits app, H-A-B-I-T-S app on Instagram, on Twitter. We want to see what you're implementing and... You know, we're just so excited to uh, start you guys off on the right foot with this app and have an awesome day. Happy New Year. We'll be talking to you guys soon. Take care.